but after that will, it will stream it live. And so if we could begin, if, if you don't mind, Mandy, if you're first up, if you'd like to take, you know, I don't know, three, five minutes, introduce yourself and talk about what the height limit means, the 50 years of the height limit means to you, and also how you think we should celebrate it in the month of October. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me again. I really do appreciate the opportunity to come and advocate for community issues at this club. This is what I consider my home based club, being that I live in Point Loma. Um, I'm a community advocate. I am I'm a proud military spouse. I'm indigenous. I'm a mother of two children. And I've lived here in San Diego since 2009. Um, I serve on the local planning board for Point Loma. Um, I serve in a variety of different um, community stakeholder groups, OB Town Council, Sunset Cliffs Natural Park Council. Um, I'm a Rotarian as well. Um, and I really do care about my community. Um, some of the issues that um, I wanna just bring, before I go into the topic, I just wanna let you know that these are all my own opinions and they don't reflect the views of any of those groups that I volunteer for. So I just wanna make that clear. But um, as a military spouse, I've lived in many beach communities throughout this lovely country of ours. And one thing that's really stood out to me when we moved to San Diego was the access um, that the public had to the coastline and that there were measures in place to keep overdevelopment. I come from Virginia Beach. If you go down the main drag of Virginia Beach, you can clearly see that they have wall-to-wall -wall hotels, high rises, um, very low easements in between the buildings to access the majority of the beach. And I would hate to see that here in our lovely community of San Diego. Um, and that's why I'm against the removal of the 30 foot height limit. I'm against measure C. And, um, and I'm worried about the impact that it's gonna have to my community. We know that Measure C is the latest attempt of our city to overturn the 1972 citizen initiated ballot measure that instituted the 30 foot height limit in our community. This has allowed all San Diegans to enjoy our coastlines and guaranteed access to our coastlines. And Measure C, unfortunately, is not being pushed by the community. It's being pushed by politicians and people who are going to monetize off of this decision. And those are the reasons I'm against the removal of the 30 foot height limit. It's gonna erode the protection that the citizen approved 30 foot height limit has protected our beaches and our coastal communities these last 50 years. And it will impede beach access for a majority of San Diegans. And it's going to um, have an impact um, on access to our community as Midway is right here in the peninsula. Um, of that parcel, that community, 88 acres of that is public land. And the concern is that public land is being auctioned off to the highest bidder, as we've seen time and time again. I believe it was Lori Saldana who said a few weeks ago, you know, it's the slot machine. You know, we see right now, currently we have a developer who's been awarded this RFP. And it's of concern that, you know, he's made a massive donation to the mayor's reelection campaign. And I believe we deserve better when it comes to um, selling off or the oversight of our public resources. Some of the concerns that I have as well is that the impact that that unchecked development is going to have on our community. We not understand that we are um, west of the I-5. There's no plans for the I-5 or the I-8 hub. Um, that is the crucial artery that gets everyone on and off of the peninsula. We have um, incredible um, backup traffic issues um, that are already existing in the community because we have a military base here. And so we have a lot of egress with people coming on and off the peninsula, coming to and from work. And there's concern about that because the city has no plans to um, expand lanes going westbound or going eastbound. There's no plans for um, investments into the lacking infrastructure in Midway or the surrounding communities. And those are some of the concerns. But ultimately we're back here because the original ballot measure was deemed illegal. It was illegal because the city did not complete the environmental impact report before placing it on the ballot. 
last time. And I will also note that we also have voter data reflecting that a majority of D2 voted against this ballot measure. We've seen the community of Midway, Point Loma, Ocean Beach, and Claremont all voted against this. So again, it's very confusing to have leadership who's advocating for something that the community doesn't want. Um, measure C is still in violation of the California Environmental Quality Act because the city did not properly study all of the impacts associated with the removal of the height limit. The supplemental environment report on the visual impacts is faulty and deficient in the scope because it fails to address, among other things, traffic and transportation impacts, biological resource impacts, and water quality and water supply impacts. They don't take into consideration the impact of taller buildings on these environmental factors, such as traffic, noise, and air quality. And the report, when it did come back, it does state in the report that the 10 view corridors that were looked throughout in the Midway area, that there would be significant and unavoidable impacts to the views and the neighborhood character with the removal of the coastal height limit. So the city is back at it again, and they're trying to hide behind the Midway Community Plan update that was approved in 2018. Again, that plan update in 2018 fell because the city's adoption of the environmental impact report for the Midway Community Planning Area has never considered anything having to do with the height limit. And the supplemental environmental report is lacking, particularly as it pertains to addressing the impacts of greenhouse gas emissions. We see that the mayor and city council chose a developer who is again overpromised what they can deliver. The proposal that is being shown for the public for redevelopment is just that, a proposal. The developer has admitted in public that this is not what the final development will look like. And I question if we'll even get the 2000 affordable rental units in the final development. And the proposed community parks in the rendering should not be located in the areas corralled and in between the buildings or located on top of a parking lot structure. It will effectively close off the community out of the much needed park space. And so, we, need a, we can clearly see that our public areas um, are being sold to the highest bidder or whoever makes the largest donations to our politician. And no one is denying that the Midway District needs to be revitalized. We do need affordable housing. However, we can meet both of those objectives without busting through the 30 foot height limit or breaking the law. We the people own 88 acres of that neighborhood. And in my opinion, this is just another dirty deal developing our elected leadership and their chosen developers. We deserve better from our elected leadership when it comes to the sale and the transparency and oversight of our public land. Measure C will allow for essentially unlimited and unchecked development of the Midway Pacific Highway community area surrounding coastal communities and beaches. And I want to again point out the voter data reflects that the community does not want this. There is not going to be any professional NBA team that will be coming to the arena. There is nothing different here. Um, and the community ultimately has been left off of the table. A lot of the discussions about this site have been a one-sided conversation and we deserve better. So again, I ask that you educate yourself and align with the community. We do not want this. The voter data reflects that. And I ask that you vote no on measure C. And I think it would be so appropriate for all of us as community members, remember this ballot measure was brought on by politicians. Prop D was brought 50 years ago by community members who stood up and saw the impact that development was having to the coastal region. And we are having that again. And I think this next month in honor of those efforts and the tenacity and the courage and the in the insight to look forward and be progressive and say we see that this is not sustainable get out the word 
go tell your community members. If you feel the same way, let them know what's going on in our community. The issue is, is that the city's working against us. We here in District 2, it's very clear um, by going on next door, you go to the OB RAG, they've been very helpful with communicating the issues to the community, but we need help. We all know someone outside of our district and we can reach out and let them know that we need their help in honoring the steps that the community took 50 years ago and the forethought and, and not undo that undo that protection of what community members brought before the city. And I think we have an opportunity with this redo to tell the city no. So thank you for your time. That's good, thank you, Mandy. And uh, yep, so then also next up then we have Jeff Page. Uh, and Jeff, I will spotlight you. And if you wanna take a few minutes, again, just to let us know what, introduce yourself. Not everybody's familiar, maybe, with the OB RAG, uh, where you write. And then also tell us a little bit about what the uh, the history of the uh, 30 Foot High Element means to you, and also how we could celebrate um, in what, what, how you think we should celebrate in the month of October. OK. Uh, OK. Everybody hear me all right? Yep. Sound great. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up a Navy kid. So I have a lot of experience with the East Coast and the South and all the other places where this kind of damage has already been done. So for me, it, it really strikes home because uh, you can go all the way from Maine down to the tip of Florida and you'll find places where the ocean has been completely walled off. Fort Lauderdale, all through Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Daytona, Miami Beach, uh, Virginia Beach that Mandy mentioned. I mean, it's just rampant everywhere. So when I got here and found out what they had done here, I thought it was the most amazing thing I'd ever heard of. Uh, so I, it's wonderful. And you can just tell the difference by looking at the coastline comparing to the East Coast. I think an awful lot of people in San Diego, my experience has been, I moved here in 77. So I've been here for 45 years and uh, 42 of those years in Ocean Beach. And one thing I did learn about San Diegans is the majority of them really haven't gone much further than Yuma or north of Los Angeles. Uh, a lot of them have just been here their whole lives uh, with not a lot of desire to travel. And, and you can certainly see why, because it's a wonderful place to just stay and be here. So I, I was kind of surprised at some of the provincialism I found when I got here. But those of us who have been to these other places, like Manny mentioned, and I have, we really know what this looks like. And we really know the value of that 30 foot height limit. I got to meet Mignon Shear uh, on the Peninsula Community Planning Board when we were both on it a number of years ago. So I got firsthand accounts from her of the effort that these people went through. And the thing that makes me angriest about this ballot measure is exactly that. These people went through an incredible effort, uh, some, of, some of them detrimental to their private lives. Uh, my understanding, a couple of marriages suffered pretty badly. And they had none of what people have today. They had to go door to door. Uh, they had to do all this by hand, and they put in this gigantic effort, and they got this thing passed. And now we have nine people sitting in a room voting to put it on, and it probably doesn't take any more than, you know, then, then go to lunch, and that's it. It's just absolutely disgusting that this thing was even allowed to be put on the ballot. So for me, the most important thing is that these people made this effort to do this, and it has protected this coastline. There's absolutely no doubt about it. You can look around, spot check a few places uh, that got up right before the thing passed. And one of them is uh, that Orchard Apartments in Ocean Beach. It's right on the corner of the bluff. It's like five stories tall. In Pacific Beach, there's another place in North Pacific. I can't think of the name of it right now, but uh, also a tall one right on there. And that's why these, pe these people noticed this and they made the effort and they got out there and did it. So for me personally, I just think the rest of us owe those people something and we, we owe them the effort to try to preserve this. Now, some people say, well, what's wrong with, with allowing it in the Midway area? All right, I'm not a young guy, I've been around a long time and I know when somebody sticks a toe in a door and that's exactly what's gonna happen with this height limit in the Midway area. They're gonna look at that and then they're gonna look at some of the adjacent areas that they can say, well, you know, if we put them here real tall, they're not gonna block the beach here either. We can go all the way out to the Barnes Center. We can start creeping out toward Ocean Beach. It's just the kind of thing that has to stop before it starts. Um, so these people over in Midway that are 
that are so for it, you know, the planning board there, I've covered them for a number of years and it's nothing personal, but that whole board is full of people who own property, uh, who have businesses in the Midway area and th their self-interest matters more than anything else. Some of the, uh, like the former chair has property right adjacent to the city's property. And they were really looking forward to having this 30 foot height limit removed. The other thing is about Midway. I was there the day that the city planning department told the Midway board that MCRD was now part of their territory. Now they never heard a thing about this in advance. They were just told, oh, by the way, we're gonna include Midway in your area, uh, MCRD in the Midway area. So just imagine what that would look like now. If you have the 30 foot height limit removed and MCRD eventually does come back to the control of the city, which I'm sure it's going to, you could have this crap marching all the way to the airport, all the way to the edge of Point Loma. Um, and I think that's what these folks have in mind. So it needs to be stopped and needs to be stopped now. Um, as far as, you know, how to celebrate it, I'm on this ad hoc committee with the, the OB RAG and they were supposed to come up with some ideas on how to celebrate it. This is really not my thing. To me, the best way to celebrate it is to vote no on this current measure. I can't think of any other better way. I think the best thing to do is just make people aware of what it could look like if it's taken away and just tell them vote no, don't, don't let it ever happen here. This is unique across the entire country. And if we let these people come through a crack, uh, it'll be the end of the 30 foot height limit eventually. And that's basically all I have to say. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and then next up we have Linda Lukax. I'll just add spotlight you here, Linda. And Hi everyone. Thanks, John. Yeah, yeah, again, if you want to take like five minutes or so and just you know, tell us what it means to you and on how you think we should celebrate um, in the month of October. Sure, thank you. So uh, just for those who don't know me, I am Linda Lucas, Dr. Linda Lucas. I am running for city council in our district. I live over in the Sunset Cliffs area of Point Loma. And I wanna thank uh, both Mandy and Jeff uh, because they, they did amazing summaries of, uh, of, of the issues that we're facing. So I'm just gonna bring it a, a little personal. So when I moved to Point Loma, I did so because this community offered certain characteristics, certain traits that I found appealing. It wasn't uh, overly built up and overly developed. And I appreciate that. I've, I've lived in areas of high density. I went to school in New York City. I know what it is to, to live it, it, with all that concrete. And so it disappoints me that we are again, uh, uh, you know, having to vote on this issue. Um, and what I find the most disheartening is that um, city council, uh, our current city council did vote to put this on the, on the ballot um, and, and I don't fault those who don't live in the area because when we look at the when we look at the renderings and we look at the rationale of uh, bringing back bringing affordable housing and revitalizing that area, it sounds really good and the renderings are are, are beautiful, but it doesn't fit with the community. And what's lacking is the consequences to this community. They're being ignored. The, the, the other individuals on council don't understand. Uh, so I think that um, voting no on this measure is certainly, in my opinion, the right thing to do. This was a people's initiative and we should uphold that. And I don't see any reason why we can't develop that area within the current restrictions. Something is, something is amiss there. When we have developers, the three developers that, um, that I interacted with, not one of them had plans that fell within our current restrictions. And I find that disingenuous, quite frankly. It's like the, we know that these restrictions are there. They're assuming that this measure will be overturned. And, um, and, and that to me is just a real sad state of affairs. I think the celebrating comes with um, just, you know, if we could keep sharing the historical perspectives 
Um, and I, I think that's the best way to garner attention to the project. Um, I think that also highlighting the issues that are important to this community that are sorely lacking in that development, the infrastructure, the strain on the infrastructure, and, and, and also to not even come to the, to the community with a plan for infrastructure. How are you going to address it? There is no plan, folks. None. We were told that directly in the meeting. They don't have a plan yet. And this plan, even though Midway Rising is touting their 4,500 residential units, a 16,000 uh, seat new stadium, a 200 suite uh, hotel and retail. There is no talk about how this area, our area is going to accommodate all of that influx uh, of traffic to our area. How are, how are emergency vehicles, vehicles going to get through uh, if we need them? Uh, and, and, and without a plan that I just can't support any development that doesn't have a plan attached to it. I'm afraid this is just another um, haphazard uh, uh, plan by the city that we're gonna get midway through it and it's going to stall because we haven't considered the consequences or we haven't, um, we haven't secured funding for, for the completion of the plan. I, I, I just uh, personally, um, I'm a, on, a, on a very personal note, I think, um, I think we haven't strategically planned uh, this development. And again, I find it very disingenuous that we, we didn't even see plans accommodating our current restrictions. So thank you for allowing me to be here and, and listening. I really, I, I am very grateful. Yeah, no, thank you, Linda, for joining. So what I'll, I'll do now is I'll, I'll add Mandy and Jeff uh, back to the spotlight for folks that are gonna be watching this um, later or watching it streaming. And then, yeah, we can move to um, uh, questions. And if people want to either put a question in the chat or if you wanna raise your hand using the little reactions button, um, that's at the bottom of your Zoom page, or if you're on a mobile, maybe an ellipsis with a more, but you can choose it. Yeah, sorry, Mandy. Yeah. Sorry, I apologize for the interruption. I did want to, uh, I put it in the chat, but I did want to let everyone that the Sierra Club, the local chapter, did vote no on C, and they are sending it up to the executive committee for consideration. So I did want to provide that update to the community. So thank you. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, and just say, yeah, the chat, if you want to save the chat as well, the three little dots or the ellipsis down the bottom right hand corner, you can always click on that anytime during the meeting, and it will save it to your your local device, if there are comments or links that are put in the meeting that you want to save for later. So yeah, let's see here then. Yeah, so we've got, do we have no, we have no hands in the chat. I can't believe it. Let's see. We'll uh, give everybody a second or you can come, come off. Oh, we have, we do have a question. Yeah. Greg or Dr. Greg Robinson, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, um, I should probably, I have a number of comments and then I do have a question. Um, I, it's too bad there wasn't uh, someone from the, the other side wasn't here to make comments on this. But I actually have a somewhat unique situation in the sense that I may be one of the few people old enough to have been around when the 30 foot height limit was uh, going on. Uh, I was a, a graduate student here at the UCSD uh, in the early 70s. Uh, I have worked extensively, actually. I, Frank Gormley and I go back way, way far back. I was on the community, also on the Peninsula Community Planning Board. Actually, Jeff, I think you came on about the same time I was on. Um, but I've also had a unique situation. And this is the, my main concern why I feel torn about this. I used to be head of the Affordable Housing Coalition. What you have said is basically, we can get the affordable housing without this change in the height limit. Where's the housing? If that were true, then why haven't we been able to develop that kind of housing? I, and I am a teacher. Um, and actually, I, also full disclosure, I am very active in the labor movement these days. I am vice president of the AFT 1931. I'm president of the Labor Democratic Club, but I'm a president of a teacher's union, not a construction union. What about the teachers right now who cannot afford to live in our community. Where is the housing gonna come for them? In a place, in an area that they can commute to. 
I don't hear the answer here. I hear people who have a concern for that, um, but not any specific plans. You talk, uh, Ms. Lucas, about the lack of plans for the city. Where are the plans to really produce the affordable housing that we so desperately need in this community? What we know in urban areas, San Diego is an example of that, 70% of the land is zoned for a single family dwelling. You can't get around that without changing that. I really recommend, this is the teacher in me, if you didn't see today's New York Times, take a look at the article on the problem of housing access in a community like San Diego, where the price of land is so insanely expensive, the only way you can start building and, uh, and accommodating more uh, people who desperately need housing is to increase density. If you add in the environmental concern, you've got to get it close to transportation corridors. The central location for trans public transportation in San Diego is in Midway. You've got to develop that land. You know, again, I've worked extensively around these kinds of issues in my past myself, and I've changed, particularly as a result of my experience with affordable housing. You know, I was right, a yeah. member of Frank Cormley with uh, OB Go, uh, with Beach Grassroots Organization. I'm currently in OB right now. I live here. But we need to take into account not merely the people who literally, people like me who are lucky enough to own a home in OB. I have a little bit of a view of the ocean. But those people who don't live here but would love to, where is the concern for them? I don't hear it here. I don't hear that concern. I hear people so Greg, who are Greg, the Greg, privileged. But yeah, I Greg, don't sorry. That, that, okay. Yeah, we're going to jump in. Just have a just, chance to have a second side to this. So I took the opportunity to do a little bit of ranting about this, especially as a proponent for affordable housing. Sure. Yeah, Greg. Thank you. Uh, just to say, you, you, because you just before the uh, panelists respond, just to say, because I think you joined the minute, uh, meeting a little bit after I began the introduction. Just to explain, we did reach out to uh, people across the panel, but on both sides, we did not get responses from DK, yeah. who is a club member from the from the planning board, nor from Jen Campbell, nor her staff. All of which we did uh, reach out to. So that's why, yeah, that what you may be hearing may not be all all the opinions on this matter but but we did the best we could in the time that we had available but yeah now thank you for the question and what we'll do we'll go in order and if we can try and limit the quote or responses i know it's kind of difficult but if we try and limit them to a minute each um, and we'll begin the same order in which people introduce themselves and then we'll rotate with each question so so Mandy, if we could begin with you and try and try and limit it to a minute. Thank you, Greg. Sure, sure. Um, one, I'm not against affordable housing. Last time around, I was concerned why there was only 10%. And back when we were here two years ago, we did have Toll Brothers came before and they were able to build affordable housing and they were able to give us twice the amount of open space that Brookfield had ended up wanting to give us. And they were able to do it under the 30 foot height limit. So I don't want to hear that argument that they can't make the numbers work. They want them to work in their favor. And that's what vertical is going to go and do for them. The other concern is, you know, you're right. We do have an affordable housing crisis and we do need to maximize a lot. In my opinion, I'd like to see a majority of that affordable. Do we have an affordable housing crisis or not? We see time and time again, our city representation, they want to sit there and say we have an affordable housing uh, crisis, but then they're like, oh, here's the short-term vacation rental policy. Here's, here's another grab here. And the question I have is, why are we the taxpayers responsible for affordable housing only? Why are we not keeping the city accountable or these employers who make billions of dollars on, uh, they're traded on the stock market? Why is it our responsibility to provide housing? And why isn't the conversation, you need to provide a livable wage that matches the region? And that's the conversation that I'd like to pose. I don't think anyone is against affordable housing. The concern is that we do have affordable housing scattered throughout our community. The impact of access that this is gonna have. And the question that we have to have tonight is, is it worth selling a neighborhood out? An entire neighborhood. We're selling an entire neighborhood. We're selling 88 acres of public land. That's billions of dollars of giveaway. Is that going to achieve affordability? And the answer is no, and it's not. And that's, that's, yeah, that, thanks, that's Manny, the yeah. concern. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, thanks. And and Jeff, if you'd like to go next. And, and again, if you can try and restrict the answer to about a minute. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Uh, 
<laughs> the thing is, Greg, that I, I personally believe that they could do all the development they need to do under the 30 foot height limit in the Midway area. As a matter of fact, the first proposals that came in had them for both. They had them for the 30 foot and they had them for the taller. So you could build an awful lot of housing over there under the 30 foot height limit. Secondly, eventually MCRD is gonna become part of Midway. There's a whole lot more land that'll be available. There's a whole lot of land all over the city that's available for doing that. Why it's necessary to put it in the most expensive real estate in San Diego makes no sense to me. And the people that you're talking about that want to live in the affordable housing want to enjoy this coastline. So what's what, what good is it going to be to completely block off the coastline with uh, getting rid of the 30 foot height limit and then living there? What's that quality of life? I think there's plenty of places to put affordable housing and they could certainly accommodate a lot of it in Midway under the 30 foot height limit. That's great. And then Linda, you want to go next? Sure. Thank you. I too believe that this, the affordable housing uh, could be accomplished uh, without lifting that height restriction, without going vertical, instead going horizontally. And it could be done so in a, in a number of ways. Um, for instance, you know, is, is it vital that the sports arena uh, entertainment center is located in this area? That could all be expanded for residential units. Um, and furthermore, I think, Greg, your point is well taken, right? So yes, we need housing, but we need a strategic plan to get there. And to me, that's very troubling that we don't have that plan. We have too many holes in how we're going to handle the infrastructure issues that we're facing. That's great, thank you, Linda. So next up, we have a question from uh, Arv and, uh, and or Nicole. Uh, um, yeah. You want to unmute yourselves? Yeah. John, um, I'll give a little historic perspective. I first moved to San Diego in 1959 with the Navy. Uh, I lived through uh, all that we've been talking about from the 50 year ago standpoint. I got involved in the uh, issue here in Pacific Beach where the uh, motto or, uh, on our bumper stickers was don't, Pacific, don't Miami Beach, Pacific Beach. It was a hell of a fight. We had lots of housing issues 50 years ago. It was hard to find affordable housing then. Salaries, of course, were much, much less, especially for the military. But somehow we all managed to do it. and. Uh, except for the two buildings here in Pacific Beach that were grandfathered in, uh, we've kept the 30-foot height limit along the coast. I don't want to see the whole uh, Rosecrans corridor in the area around uh, our airport and uh, possibly MCRD. And of course, the whole uh, Spaywar complex along Pacific Highway is also going to be a uh, high rise if they have their way. We don't want any of that. So I think uh, affordable housing, of course, is necessary, but it's also a red herring in this issue. We want to keep coastal access. We want to keep our community the way it is. So it, th that's my historical perspective. We, of course, are going to vote no. That's probably the best celebration of just voting no and winning. That, that's great. Thanks, Arv. And so, um... We'll go to the next question then for Laurie. Laurie, Laurie if you want to come off mute. Yes, thank you. There I go. Um, a couple of things. As someone who has uh, lived in this, I'm having trouble with my camera now. As someone who has lived in this community all my life and represented it for many years, including as housing chair, it's, it's really disturbing to see these decisions made with pay to play politics. And as Maddie pointed out, it's like slot machine. We're finding out now that a lobbyist was paid a considerable amount of money, didn't report it until well, until after the vote was taken by the council. Um, this is Gil Cabrera, former chair of the city ethics commission, well aware of the rules. He filed his 2020 rep 2021 reports late. And so the entire appearance of this is that they are negotiating in bad faith, quite frankly, that the person who's getting this, this opportunity to develop didn't get it on the merits on the, the they got it because they paid, um, they, they paid for it. And I think that's what really turns people off. 
Um, the other thing is uh, having taught in the Midway District for eight years, we had frequent plumbing problems. I just put in a, a public record act request to find out just how often the street near our campus was collapsing. There was trench work that needed to be done. That water table in that area is so high that if you start putting in high rise buildings and a lot of infrastructure, um, you're, you're gonna have problems that are not being addressed at this point. So for the financial reasons, the environmental water table reasons and many more, uh, I really encourage this club to oppose this project if that's what's on the agenda today. Uh, I, I think we're rushing ahead way too fast and it's starting to look increasingly very troubling from the ethics uh, standpoint as well. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Laurie. And then we have Gary uh, Wojcik. Gary, if you want, or, or Dave, if you want to come off mute. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I want to thank uh, Linda, Mandy and Jeff for um, being involved in this. I really appreciate your uh, you know, commitment to the community. And I think they summed it up very nicely. Um, you know, if, um, as Linda said, if they're, if they're so interested in developing this, um, you know, affordable housing, why, why don't they take some of that away from the sports arena that they're, they're promoting to build in that area? You know, Jeff mentioned, you know, this is a slippery slope. This is going to be development creep. They're just going to keep on the start here and they'll just continue to do this. And as Mandy said, there's no, no, you know, no plan. I mean, there's no, there was no infrastructure uh, thing that was development. You know that was that was looked at there and overall there's just no strategic plan this is so typical of everything that the city of san diego does they bomb ahead with these ideas have no strategic plan and then what they do is they they bang the drum for affordable housing and then everybody says oh yeah this is a great idea they need a plan they never have one so i just want to thank you three for being so involved in this you're, i really appreciate it your, your uh, credit to the community. Thank you so much. That's great. Thanks, Gary. And then next up, uh, Ruth. Yes, thank you. Sort of a point of history. I can remember back when Liberty Station was being developed. The housing there was supposed to be uh, moderately priced so that they were pushing teachers and policemen, et cetera, could afford them about 250,000. Doesn't that sound great? However, when they actually built it, the average price moved up to closer to half a million instead of a quarter. And it, you know, it just, whatever they said, it didn't work out that way. And how can we be sure what the prices are gonna be on their supposedly affordable housing, their low income housing. I mean, if, there, if this is gonna be approved, we need some assurances, actually guarantees in writing. Maybe the make the developer pledge their firstborn or something <laughs> if they don't do it. But I'm sorry, it's just, it was so frustrating. And having been a former realtor and going to some meetings with current ones um, back in those days, it, it was just appalling what they promised and what we got. So think about that. Thank you, Ruth. And then are there more questions that people want to put either in the chat or if you want to raise your hand or, or if you can't find the raise your hand, but oh, Linda, yes, yeah, sorry, if you want to go ahead. Hi, thanks, Ruth. I, I just want to address your comment because we can't be sure. Midway Rising has told us very specifically that, that this is only a plan. They're not committed to doing what they say they are in this, in this pre-development phase, right? So we don't know what we're going to get, which is, is, is a very scary thought. And I, th I think that's why the co community is concerned as well. I mean, um... We had a little bit more time. We knew this was coming, but again, this has been a one-sided conversation. I feel um, the mayor's made the selection. I really wish that there would have been more input, but again, having all the RFP applicants state that they even stated in the, at the PLA event that they'd never worked with the city that had a process like this. Typically when they work with cities, They've got a plan for the infrastructure. They have a plan for the parks. They've got a plan for the community. And then they bring in the developer. There's no plans. And I don't 
feel that with the history of our city elected leadership, they have continually lied or overpromised and underdelivered on these housing initiatives. And the concern is again that they pick and choose when we're in an affordable housing crisis. I double down on what Linda is saying as well. Why do we need an arena? I mean, I know it's a, a music uh, venue. Outside of that, I'm concerned that when they bulldoze it, is there any guarantee that it's gonna keep the same capacity limits? Um, the other issue is I know for a fact that the, the, uh, the Anaheim Ducks is the, uh, the Gulls, the Gulls are a development pipeline for the Anaheim Ducks. And I know for a fact that they have no plans to expand or de that development team or expand any type of uh, emphasis on that team. It's just a development pipeline for the Anaheim Ducks. You know, if we are really in an affordable housing crisis, is there an opportunity to remove the hotel and the arena? You know, those are some opportunities that I believe the city could have a conversation about. But what's concerning is, again, is the community is not bought into this. We voted against it. And again, we're, we're here and the city's going to use the rest of the districts, the rest of the city to work against this narrative. Um, and so I, I'd like us to, to start over with the opportunity of redeveloping that area and keep it under the 30 foot. That's good. Yeah. And Jeff, do you want to add a comment? Yeah. One, I'm not exactly sure how to articulate this, but one thing we have to be careful of is the 30 foot height limit is for the entire Midway area. This project is a small part of Midway. And so it's, it's definitely important to focus on the project because that's what got all this started. But I think everybody needs to, you know, that's part of it. That's one of the effects. But the other effect is look at the rest of Midway. I mean, it's a huge area. There's all kinds of private property owners in there that are looking to shoot up and they're not gonna have any controls whatsoever. The city's making kind of promises about their development. Oh, the buildings will only be I think they said 70 feet or 80 feet, something like that. But that doesn't stop the rest of the development that's gonna happen all over Midway. The whole Midway area, including MCRD eventually, is gonna look like a giant forest of buildings with no controls whatsoever. So I think people need to focus on the larger issue of the, the whole coastline. And then the issue below that is the whole area of Midway. And then the issue of that project, that, that stuff all matters. So it's, it's a very broad effect on the whole city, but, but look at that area and where it's situated, what would that look like? And then you have to figure in, of course, what the Navy's gonna do with NAVWAR. Yeah. And before you know it, it's just gonna be a forest of buildings all the way to the airport. So people, we need to emphasize to people that this, this measure is protecting that whole area. You can see across all that wonderful stuff to the bay and to the ocean right now. And that ain't gonna happen if this thing gets pulled. That's good. Thank you, Jeff. And then Ruth, do you have a, a follow-up? You're on mute. Okay. Um, when I Whoops. Yeah, you're still on mute. Sorry. When I first moved down here, I, I lived in an apartment off of uh, Midway and near Rosecrans. And an airplane would take off and you'd have to suspend your conversation because it was so noisy. And starting to think about these height limits and raising them that close to the airport, I would think the airport authority would be massively upset about having that. I mean, I've, stu I've been stuck at the traffic light down there and the planes are just flying overhead. And I would hate to be living in a... 80 foot tall apartment hut complex when those planes go over when when I was living in a two story when you couldn't hear to talk. Anyway, yeah, no, thank my comments. Yeah, no, that's good. Thank you, Ruth. And I saw Kathy Blavitz has joined the meeting and, and was raising a hand on the I, I didn't see it. But thank you, Angela, for bringing my attention. I can't see everybody who's on the screen at my end. So um, Kathy, if, if you'd like to go next. Yeah. Um, historically, uh, I was very active uh, from like 1999 on. This plan is just a redo of what they tried to put through uh, in 2002, 2003 roughly. They said 
4,000 uh, units, 10 stories high at the sports arena, which is basically what they're asking for now. Um, they also, it was including 96 acres, which included the nearby businesses that are on city owned land. But they also wanted to take out the orchard senior housing and the Stonewood apartments. We stopped them on both of those at the time. And now the, uh, uh, Lori could attest, they now have a 50 year lease on the um, orchard. Unfortunately, the Stonewood got turned into VM income and it went up right away. This was, I don't know, 12 years ago, $1,000 per room. And now it's more than that. There was no reason to take that out. It was, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, Section 8 and poor people lived there. Also, Bernard School, I went to the Midway PAC meetings. They said that it could be a park. They had the lots next door to it and put in baseball fields. Midway has no park, no baseball fields. And they're talking about all this stuff going on now and they took out a school. And they said it was gonna be low medium income housing. Well, it wasn't. We got postcards that said resort luxury housing. And so it's kind of hard to sit here and say, oh, well, the city's going to give us this. Well, they took it out over and over again. They've taken it out. And the same with Naval Training Center. Naval Training Center had a plan. It was about five inches thick. I read through it and everything down there was a bait and switch. And Byron Weir, when he was council person, he was pushing these plans and he's on the board of this sports arena thing again. You know, it's, I'm a historian, I've written books, you know, and I have a lot of the documentation from 20 years ago, and then they brought it up again in 2007. It seems like every four to five years, they're, they're trying to blow the height limit out here. Those people, when I gave the talk before, I told you they ended up in divorce, a lot of them. It was a seven year process. It bothers the heck out of me that they can just, the council vote to do this and not even collect signatures to put it on the ballot. That is one of the most outrageous things about this. You know, because uh, Floyd Morrow, back when the 30 foot people went to council, he was the only one that voted against it. Well, here we have one person that voted against it here. But the thing is, they were allowed to take it to the courts after it got voted in by the people. It was a seven year process. And I sit here and look on the OB reg and somebody says, oh, well, they just couldn't, couldn't do it. They have no idea of the history, what it took with these people. And Mignon and Alex, they gave their lives to this for a lot of years. And I gave a lot of mine. I went to PAC meetings. I sat on the Peninsula Planning Board. I, I've been involved in the Ocean Beach Historical. I had Alex come down for the 40th anniversary of the 30 foot height limit. It's a really big deal. Uh, Zuquette, he made the single occupancy hotels downtown, like a dozen of them that no longer serve the homeless. So there's really, you know, they've been taking this out for the poor people and in section eight for a long, long time. And that day was really outrageous because Mel Shapiro was there and we waited because they, they stopped the council at five. They went in and had pizza. They came back at 5.30 after the press left and they voted on one of the hotels. And I know Greg had been down there protesting earlier in the week. The only other people besides us that were there were the handicapped people and the people from that hotel. There were about 650 people who were getting evicted and out on the streets within a month or so from that hotel. And the other hoteliers were there licking their lips because they could now take their single occupancy hotels and turn them into other hotels. And they never replace that housing for the poor people. So when they sit here and say homeless, homeless, they've done nothing except boot these people on the street. And 
you know, this has nothing to do with the homeless because they're not going to do anything. And um, and what they call, you know, medium income, and this is a lot more than a lot of people I know that are, uh, you know, in straits. And uh, I've had a lot of friends have it, having to leave OB, and I understand about you know, not having this, but where were everybody when they were taking all this out? You know, another friend of mine, Section 8, uh, over at the barns uh, by the tennis courts there, that housing supposed to be Section 8. My friend, we go there. Oh, no, it's only for military. And yet on their website, they say it's for Section 8. So uh, she couldn't even fill in a form there to try and go there. And she's 92 years old. It's just ridiculous how the uh, city treats the poor people and so, and seniors, it's really bad. And um, I'm glad that Orchard at least is still there for some people, but the 30 foot, it, it, you know, there's a water table under here. The city has records of it. And um, Helen Fricker, who, who just did this study uh, a few years ago, you know, she's a friend of mine. She's going, this, this is ridiculous because building high rises on a water table that in 10 to 20 years, water's gonna be seeping up is really crazy. And um, like Mandy said, uh, I knew a printer there. They were trying to eminent domain properties behind the sports arena on Kurt Street. And I, I'm still in contact with some of those people, but the only, Union print shop that Zuket used for his own printing, uh, they were going to take them out. And also, they told me that they went down to work on their toilet. They dug three feet down and hit mud and water. It's down there. This is a floodplain. And um, it, uh, it used to be part of the river. And the river used to go through MCRD and all that area. It's not real buildable land. That's why they didn't build a lot earlier because it, it was a wetlands. West Point Loma, you know, they have the trussels there from the old streetcar. That's because it was wetlands, you know? And so it's not the right place. And you don't want to put homeless down there in the middle of a flood zone if, it, you know, and, and high rises, uh, you know, Helen had a great thing. She said, they're calling it um, rising. Well, it's actually sinking. <laughs> and um, so we, we need to really understand what's going on here. And MCRD, there, I've heard all kinds of things that could happen there, including runways, including high rises. You know, they haven't given real good plans and the military, uh, you know, at least with NTC, they gave a plan. Everything was a bait and switch over the next few years, but this you're not even hearing what they have planned for it. And it's, it just seems like the public is being left out more and more and the corporate powers to be and uh, uh, the politicians are really becoming a problem here on not helping the people or representing us anymore. And Campbell has done little to represent our district here. So anyhow, I'll shut up from now. You heard my talk before. So. <laughs> but if you have any questions about some of this, because like I said, I have a big history going back a lot of years in dealing with this. And uh, it's just really hard to take over and over again. No, thank you, Kathy, for joining and offering that perspective. Um, and I don't know if the panelists want to comments on, on any of the points that Kathy made? And yeah, if we want to start with Jeff, if you want to come off mute, Jeff. Sorry. Um, I spent my whole life in the construction industry. So one of the things that I tend to comment on are uh, when people, what Kathy was talking about in the water table and all that. Um, and I, I kind of discourage people from kind of making too big an issue of this because things can be built anywhere. I've seen it in my career. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. They, they can build on air if they want to. It's just, just how much money do they want to spend. So it's not an issue that I think people should really push too hard of the difficulty of the uh, construction there because it, it can be done. Um, it's going to cost more. And so I'm kind of curious how they plan to 
come up with all this affordable housing because it definitely will cost more to build these tall buildings over there. They'll have to put in piling, they'll have to put in dewatering systems and a number of things. So it, it's a concern, but it's not something to really hang your hat on when you're criticizing this development because there's so many other things that we can criticize besides that. So I, I don't mean to throw a wet blanket on that, but I, from my experience, I heard the same thing about the uh, Mimosa Canyon. You know, people were worried about, oh, we can't build there because there's certain physical restrictions. And believe me, they can get past any physical restriction they need to if they want to spend enough money. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And that, Linda, did you want to have a, a, a response to Kathy's, some of Kathy's comments? No, I, I, Kathy, I just really appreciate the historical perspective. So, uh, so I really thank you for sharing that. Uh, I share a lot of your concerns as well, though. That's good. And Mandy? Um, again, I, I appreciate Kathy. She, you know, I, I met with her last week and had lunch and um, she's always such a wealth of knowledge. And I think that's something that, you know, especially being a younger um, community member, you know, um, learning from history, learning from history. And we have an opportunity here. No one is just saying that we don't want the Midway area revitalized. No one is saying that. Um, I'm not against affordable housing. Um, like I said, I, let's, let's, let's do more for that, but we need to look on the return on investment, the cost, is it sustainable? Is it financially and environmentally feasible? And with that growth and the impact that that density is going to have to our community and to the coastal access, is it worth selling out an entire neighborhood? And in my opinion, it's not. This is the same dirty development deal. They're just getting more ambitious. <laughs> they're going for an entire neighborhood and they're saying it in the name of affordable housing. But I can guarantee you the end result will not ensure affordability and we need to do better when it comes to city resources. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Mandy. And thanks, Kathy. And I think with that, I don't see any more questions in the, in the chat. So what I'd, I'd like to do, um, I have one more question, but it's just specific to Linda. Um, and this is a question from one of the club members. Um, and they, they, they mentioned that you present a refreshing alternative to our terrible city council representative. I'm reading this, Jen Campbell. However, though it's not a directly relevant to working as a council person, it is vital for this club to know if you are pro-choice. And so the question is, are you? because we can't afford to elect anyone who isn't pro-choice. We appreciate council members don't get to weigh in on that, but council members have a history of running for other things after they become council members. So yeah, but just that specific question, if you could address that, that'd be great. Uh, I'd love to address that. Thank you. And thank you for whomever provided that question. Yes, I am pro-choice. Um, and, and I just want to draw, so there, there might be other questions you have for me that are, or, are, are, are more uh, about national politics. And if I could just draw um, to some attention to Judy Curry. Judy Curry and I met, oh, I don't know, it's probably been a couple months ago now. And um, Judy interviewed me. Uh, the first day was all about uh, local issues. And I, and I smiled because I said the first day. So it was, it was pretty intense. It was a couple hours long. And we talked all about local issues, which are, which are really important for the city council role. And uh, the next day I got an email from Judy and she said, well, we'd like to do a part two. And so would you be willing to answer these questions that are you know, more of, of nationally charged? And so I, I answered them. So if, if you wanna check some, some of my, my comments and positions on other national issues, if the, the OB RAG was kind enough to publish it. Uh, so it is, is, it is in there. Uh, and, and if you have any questions, please, uh, you know, please contact me. I'm running for this office as a neighbor and a friend and a community member and someone who's passionate about this district. So thank you. That's great. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for answering that. And so with that, we'd like to do just a quick summary. And again, maybe just a minute to say, how do you all think we should best, or how can we as a club best celebrate um, the 50th anniversary of the 30 foot height limit. And, and if we can begin with Mandy. 
first, you're going to all vote no on measure C. That's the first thing. And the second thing is tell your friends. We, this was a community initiative and it was only successful because people reached out to fellow community members and did the footwork. And that's the value that we have in this is connecting with our community members. That's what makes us stronger. The other thing I'd like to encourage you is I know that the OB RAG is going to have several announcements coming forward. I believe there's going to be a sign making contest. I'd like to see your artwork, maybe put vote no on measure C, make your own custom sign, put it out in your front yard in a visible place. But I think an easy email writing campaign, I will be posting on Nextdoor, and maybe this is an idea for the, the committee at the RAG, to create a very basic email of why we need the help and why we don't want this development and why we're voting no on measure C. And tell your friends, we all know someone outside of our district. Send your email out, spread the word. That's how you can honor the legacy of the people because the 30 foot height limit, the San Diego that you all go outside and enjoy, the America's finest city, the coastal height limit has created that environment and has preserved that environment for us. And that's how I'd like you to honor um, the 50 foot um, anniversary of Prop D. Thank you. That's great, thank you, Mandy. And then Jeff, you wanna go next? Oh, okay. Um, like I said, I'm not really great on the idea of, you know, what, what would be good celebrations. I think the main thing would be just to get the word out. Uh, for me, what I would like to do is have everybody get a picture of Fort Lauderdale or Daytona and keep it in their pocket and show people and say, is this is what you want for your coastline? The aware, I think getting that awareness, you know, people think that this this height limit is just for the people who live here at the coast. And that's the idea I think that needs to be dispelled. This coast is for everybody. You just go down on the OB pier and that will give you the best idea possible. I've run down there for many, many years and there's people from all over the county and not to mention the tourists. People love this coastline. So it's not just for those of us who live here. We just happen to live here. Um, I didn't come here because I knew there was a coast limit, height, height limit, I found OB and I fell in love. So we need to make everybody understand it's not just us in OB or at the beach. It's everybody. That's great. Thank you, Jeff. And then Linda. Yeah, thanks. I, th I think the most honorable way to celebrate it is to vote no. Um, and, and that said, spreading the word, certainly. But I really think it's important to provide the history behind it. And I would love to see Kathy, uh, Kathy provide some of that history in a written format that, that, that might be publishable so that people understand what's at stake here. I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think that there is a lot known about the history uh, in, in our communities. And, and I think it's good to promote it and, and talk about why it's important uh, to respect uh, the work that was already done. No, that's great, thank you. And thanks everybody. Thank you again, for taking the time this afternoon to come and join us to discuss this. Um, and before we go then, I think we had a, we had a motion that we'd um, sent out um, on the email to members that we would consider today um, voting to support, you know, the ad hoc committee that folks here have mentioned, um, you know, has been formed to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And then I think I've amended it slightly to capture the spirit of what everybody's been saying this afternoon. So the proposed motion but the amended language reads to the club then would take a position of support championing the 50th anniversary of this historic landmark by voting no on measure C. And so I don't know if I could get a- uh... I second it. Yeah, thank you. Perfect, read my mind. And with that, is there any, any further discussion? And again, you can raise your hand on Zoom or, or come off mute. Um, hearing no further discussion, um, is there anybody opposed for the club taking that position of supporting championing the 50th anniversary by voting no on Measure C? Okay, hearing no, it's passed unanimously. Thank you very much again, everybody, for coming to discuss that. Um, and with that, we'll now move to our next order of business. And if you don't mind, Linda, as a as a, not a member of our party, but a member of the others, would ask you to um, 
drop off the meeting at this stage because the next bit is kind of something that's more kind of internal to the party folks that are here, if that's okay. But we want to thank you again for coming and joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you all and have a great weekend, rest of your weekend. Okay, thanks. Okay, so with that then, uh, we'll move to the next order, order of business, which folks who, who were at the beginning of the meeting um, will have caught the fact we amended the agenda so we could have a, a discussion with club members here on what position, if any, the part of the club should take with the recent news um, this week regarding the uh, William Rodriguez Kennedy. Um, and so with that, I will first recognize um, Arv and uh, Nicole, if you would like to introduce the subject. Uh, yes, um, I would I would like to call on the um, club to call to, um, let's see, call for the resignation, the removal uh, of uh, Will Rodriguez Kennedy as chair. I think he's an incredible embarrassment to the party. I think he's doing incredible damage uh, to the county party. Um, and I don't know how many others uh, have refused to give donations to the to the county uh, party since Will has been in charge, but um, I wouldn't trust him with any money. Um, and um, um, I think what this current situation is, is, is just deplorable and he needs to be removed before he does any more damage. Uh, Al Franken was uh, drummed out of his Senate seat for uh, uh, suggestion of something that that is far far lesser than what um, this guy is accused of, and uh, apparently he has a history of uh, misbehavior. I'll, I'll be polite about what I've said. No, it's good. Thank thank you, um, Nicole. And and I see in the chat we have uh, a second um, for that motion, and so for discussion then. Um, if you want to raise your hand, um, either in the Zoom under the little reactions button, um, or if you wave on the screen, somebody will hopefully bring it to my attention for the folks that I can't see. But first up, we have Ruth. I just wanted to read what it says on the local news today. The headline is, Civil Suit Accuses Ex-Dem Party Chairman of Rape. Rodriguez Kennedy denies claim, plays recording in defense. Well, I'm saying they're saying he's the ex party chairman when he doesn't think he is. And he needs to be. He needs to be deleted from anything dealing with our county Democratic Party. I feel strongly about that because he's given us a lot of bad publicity. And it's hard to undo it, even if he's not guilty, which I doubt. But um, anyway, enough of that. That's good. Thank you, Ruth. And then Laurie, you're next. Okay. Um, thank you. So I, I support the spirit of this motion, but I think because we have um, a pretty extensive bylaws, procedures within the Central Committee in terms of how someone can be removed, um, I, I don't know that that a club calling for a resignation um, is going to really have an effect. Um, I, I think his behavior is troubling to say the least. Um, I, I wonder if Nicole would accept a modification that we have a vote of no confidence, um, let the, the central committee leadership, the ethics committee the, and the rest kind of figure out what the actual actions need to be to, to sort out how he will be removed because he did voluntarily take a leave of absence. So it needs to be made clear that those of us who are um, do not support his return, are, we don't have confidence in his leadership. Uh, so I would just, uh, I, as I say, I support the, the general uh, intent of this. I would just wordsmith it a bit and have a vote of no confidence um, because ultimately the, the actions have to be taken through the process that the Central Committee has in place. That's good. Thanks, Laurie. And we'll hold that thought for a minute or that suggestion. And we'll go to Susan next. Um, I, I really find that this the the um the absolute 
silence of our local Dems, elected Dems, has been deafening. It's been absolutely creepy. And in, it almost seems as if we're looking at Will blackmailing them in, in real time that there's he's got other things that he could um he could hold over them so everyone is is silent there's i i haven't heard really much of anything so and i also think that this is a really juicy story and that the national news especially conservative news is going to have a field day with and if we don't do something if we don't come out and get out ahead of it, we're all going to look like hypocrites and we're all going to look foolish and irresponsible that we have uh, not said a word about behavior that is on its face very abusive um, in, in private relationships. And, and that William has exhibited questionable, questionable um, um, uh, his actions are questionable in that he would even think that he had to record someone that he, for his own protection. Um, why would you even have that person um, even close to you? So that to me is questionable behavior and it, it's, it's abusive, on its and manipulative and uh, on its face. So uh, I really think it's important that we do say something. Maybe it will give us some of our electeds some backbone to actually um, m make something to say something because it, it, the silence is just creepy. I, I just I don't like it. All right. No, that's good. Thank you, Susan. And I see you have your hand raised, Ruth. But just to check first if there are other other members who want to um, offer any any comments or, or have any questions as well if if people are not familiar or have any clarifying questions before we come back to you Ruth basically no, I, I, I wanted to say yeah yeah go ahead this is his third time uh, he was the participant in two other where he supposedly was the victim and got well paid for it uh, the second time, and it's just having been supposedly a victim that he could now be the uh, um, what the aggressor. Um, I you know maybe everybody doesn't know about his other activities, but he's got to be gone. And right now, I think the only voting member of the Democratic Central Committee that we have in the club, correct me if I'm wrong, is Lori. So, and she's, anyway, enough. No, it's good, thank you, Ruth. So yeah, I don't know, are there any other comments? Any suggestions? So just, just to summarize what I, oh, Greg, yes. Do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, everyone else, I find this whole situation deeply disturbing. Um, but I think what Laurie said makes sense to me, that we indicate our concern about the issue, our repugnance at the implications of this, but we also need to be concerned about the due process. My understanding, again, I all I know is what I read in the paper. So if other people are better informed on this, there was uh, a refusal by the DA to, uh, to press any charges. So initially, that would seem to be making the issue complicated. There clearly is a civil case going through um, and also the internal process of the Democratic Party. Uh, I just don't want to get ahead of all those. I mean, I think we have every responsibility to express our concern about this. But in the process, we also need to express our concern about due process and evidentiary driven decisions. So it's just, it's a mess. And I wish it, I wish we could just step away from it, but in fairness to all sides and our principles, I don't think we can. I think we have to uh, do more or less what Lori suggested, which is to express our concern, but emphasize that we need to have it go through the internal processes I just mentioned. That's good, thank you, Greg. 
And then, yeah, Arv and Nicole. Uh, yes, I think that we need to make as strong a statement as possible. Um, and I think we also need to look at the pattern that we've had in our in our party. Remember Kevin Beiser, same sort of thing, uh, and the former chair of the California uh, California party, Bauman. Um, there's a pattern here, and um, I'm, you know, there the the the, the, the Q faction of the MAGAs are uh, talking about um, uh, democratic pedophiles. Well, these may not be pedophiles, but it's still sexual uh, in inappropriate sexual inappropriate sexual behavior I, I i we can't tolerate this sort of behavior we need we need to take a take a strong statement um and i agree with that due process but we also need to send a strong signal that we need to take action and it's got to be resolved and the only way to resolve it is by removing him by whatever means or or forcing get forcing him to re resign but we, our elected officials also need to take a stand. This is inappropriate. We do not need to be, lit, be uh, led by somebody who is as creepy as he is, uh, who has uh, engaged in financial improprieties and certainly uh, very clearly uh, appears to have engaged in um, sexual misconduct. Yeah, no, th thank you, uh, uh, Nicole. And then Laurie, do you want to Yes, I think the, um, the the value of a vote of no confidence is that that Will has made statements to the effect that he is considering running for re-election as chair. His term is almost up. His term ends this year. Um, that's why I think having uh, clubs, you know, if this club takes that step to issue a letter of a vote of no confidence, a desire that he not continue as chair and that he not continue to represent the party, um, and encourage other clubs to then submit similar uh, letters to the Central Committee, to the um, Ethics Committee. Um, I, I think that that is going to have a, a good effect um, and let them know that uh, we are concerned. We don't want this person being seen as a representative for our county party. Um, but then, as I say, they have to do their process. And I know it's already started. Um, but then with new information coming out in the last week, they have to go back and revisit what they had done before the lawsuits and allegations came out. So um, I think a letter would be good. I think it's going to just be part of an ongoing process leading up to the having to do a new election for a chair in a very short time. That's good, thank you, Laurie. So, so in terms of process then, yeah, we could, I, I, think, I think it's clear, yeah, there are different, as, as Greg mentioned, there's different, um, due process playing out here, which is correct as it should. And the so the there's a civil suit which will work its way through. There's the Ethics Commission of the San Diego County Democratic Party, which will work its way through. Um, and, and the statement I think made in the Union Tribune article the other day from um, Rodriguez Kennedy's lawyer was that he intends to um, apply to come back as chair after the November election. I'm just pulling up the text. There's a link in the um, in the chat to the words in that article, and and there it says, yeah, he plans to request reinstatement to his post as Democratic Party chair after the November election. His attorneys said on Friday. So I'm trying to summarize what I what I heard, maybe in terms of how we could express this for the for the club, is that we could we could write something to the effect that. Um, we we, yeah, we 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 encourage him not to return, not to request reinstatement as party chair, um, and that would leave the party with the choice of either leaving the interim chair in place until the January uh, reorganisation election, which takes place in January, on the third Tuesday of January, I think. Um, would you know? It's practically how it could work out. Or if he were to resign as chair, currently he's taken a leave of absence. If he were to, to resign and not be removed by the central committee, then I believe that would trigger a chair's election uh, this year. So I don't know, just without doing it formally, I don't know, Laurie or, or Arv or Nicole or Greg, um, do you have an opinion on as to, you know, the form of words and or 
how we should do that with members. We could obviously draft something, circulate it to members electronically, get feedback, and then submit it. But yeah, Laurie, if you want to go ahead. So I think opposing the reinstatement, um, supporting, we have a, our current interim or acting chair, uh, I think voicing support for her to continue in that position um, would also be helpful. And um, so I, I think this is basically all, at the strongest thing the club can do is express the desire for, um, you know, for him to not be reinstated because of a lack of confidence in his ability to represent us, you know, with integrity and whatever, however we want to wordsmith that. Um, but I think it would be important also to, to support the current chair who's been really struggling with this. Um, and I think she would appreciate knowing, Becca Taylor would appreciate knowing that um, the preference is for her to continue um, until the end of this term. And then, as I say, we only have a couple more meetings before we do the January election for new officers. Yep, yeah. that makes sense. I, I, I support that approach. I think that's uh, expressing support for Becca, Becca Taylor, um, and that um, he not be reinstated and he not return as chair. And I agree, a vote of no and no confidence, definitely. But I think I I I I agree with that approach. That's good. And Susan. Um, I would also like to just make sure that he's no longer um called the chair of the party. Um that because that that alone is um embarrassing. Some somehow if we could put that in the letter, which I, I think because Nicola is a professional writer, she writes for a living. I was wondering if um, we might ask her if she would um, uh, give us our first rough draft. Um, Nicole, would you be willing to do that? Uh, I was thinking about that. And unfortunately, I think anything I wrote would be too incendiary. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we, that's why I was thinking of rough draft so that you know we could we could uh, the, the executive board could kind of workshop it from there. Um, but, um, you know, it needs to be strong. Yeah, I think the, I think the words that Lori suggested were actually appropriate, but I think the vote of no confidence and, and yes, dissociating him from the um, chairmanship and um, expressing confidence in the, in the current chair, current yeah. acting chair or whatever her title is. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I think anything the way I feel, anything I wrote would not be appropriate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and Ruth? I suggest that Laurie write it and then just run it by the board of directors of the club and then submit it under as a club communication. Does that sound reasonable, Laurie? Uh, how about John and I take a, a swing at this? Yeah, okay. I was gonna, yeah, perfect. I was going to say, yeah, if, if we can take that as an action item, and, unless the members disagree, is that yeah, I, I think the gist of it is that is that we we have a vote of we as a club, and we'll take the vote now just to make sure we have everybody on the same page. Is that we have no confidence um, in Rodriguez Kennedy leading the party as chair, and that we would support the continuation of. Uh, Becca Taylor as the interim chair and for the end of the current period, which expires in January, and then there'll be an election of a new chair. And do we want to circulate this in addition to submitting it to the central committee? Um, do we want to share it with other clubs? Oh, uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think a number of clubs have reached out. Yes. So I think we would do that and circulate it with those folks. Um, yeah, for sure. So with, with that, I, I appreciate, I haven't words crafted it perfectly, but vote of no confidence, supporting the interim chair. Um, if, if we take that as a motion for members, um, is there any further discussion? No move. Okay. Second. Okay, that's good. And then um, anybody opposed to the club taking that position? Okay, here we know we'll pass that unanimously. Thank you, everybody, for sticking around and doing that. I know it's not a 
the most inspiring thing we could be talking about when we face all the problems we have coming up in these November elections. But it is important, I think, to uh, to to have a vocal position on this rather than say nothing. Yeah, sorry, Greg, I see you. Yeah, yeah. I honestly, I, I'm just concerned about the due process and the fact this leads into some stereotypes about gay behavior. Um, and so I, I'd like to be noted that I abstained. Okay. Yeah. No. Certainly, Greg. Yeah. Yeah. So no, it's very disturbing. But we, got, but I just, you know, my my kid is bisexual, so I I just don't want to rush to judgment just because of stereotypes. And it, I feel the same pain. The same con same concern. I just want to note, however, that I yeah. No, I, I appreciate your concern, and and I can assure you, yeah, we we will distribute the wording before uh, with club members before we uh we send it out. But yeah, we want to just stick to the, um, you know, very factual and and to do with the confidence in the ability of somebody to lead the party. The the other issues, as you mentioned, will will work their way out through the processes that are already in motion. And those we will not be commenting upon or weighing in on. Uh, I don't think that, as you say, would be appropriate. So with that then, um, if we're in agreement, we'll move on to officer reports. Um, and we'll do these speedily here because we're just at 5.30. And first up, if he's still here, is Kip. Yes. Everybody, so nice to see so many of you at the barbecue last month. Um, just a quick order of business um, would be to approve the July meeting minutes that were sent out in an email in August. Um, and then look out for tonight's minutes and the summer barbecue minutes in the forthcoming email. Um, and hopefully next time around we'll approve those two. But today, um, soliciting a motion to approve the July general club meeting minutes. And move we approve the July minutes. Thank you, Ruth. Um, are there, is there any opposition? I'll second it. Oh, is that you, Leslie? Yes. Thank you. Um, any, anyone opposed? No. I'm not trying to steal your thunder here, John, but it looks like those minutes are approved. Um, and that's the end of my report. No, that's perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Kip. And uh, Angela, you're up next. So thanks to um, motions that were approved in both our July and August meetings related to supporting some of our endorsed candidates. Um, we've I've gone about doing that. And as a result, if you include um, payments that have actually cleared our checking account, as well as ones that have been written, uh, our bank balance will be then at $7,477. Um, so we still have a healthy balance in our account, um, plus having um, provided support for some of our endorsed candidates. Um, we did have a great summer party. We had 59 attendees um, and everybody seemed to enjoy it. And as of now, we have 113 members uh, this year for the club. And that's my report. That's great. Thanks, Angela and Leslie. Um, I just wanted to thank you and Susan um, for that wonderful texting party yesterday morning. Um, it, you know, but we got a note from um, Barbara Bree saying that over 200,000 texts had been sent, which blows my mind. I've never been to an event like that, and I really enjoyed it. And I think um, it, it, I hope it's encouraging for others that are in the club who might be hearing this that that they would get involved because I know she's still looking to send out 145,000 um, here very soon. I'm looking at the exact number, 145,000 by Friday night. So, um, and this can be done at home and all you do is go mm, like this. That's all it takes with you and your phone. Um, and I, and I critical to me was that my cell phone number not be used and the software she's using gives a different number so that you are not traceable back and any responses you get go back to Barbara um, herself. And we saved almost $40,000 um, in, in this effort, um, 8,000 from just your wonderful event um, at um, your house. 
And, but it, it'll all told about $40,000, she said, um, by doing it this way. So I'm a fan. I just wanted to put it out there and she needs more help this week. So, and it can be done at home. Yeah, no, that's great, Leslie. And thank you. Thank you for get, get coming yesterday. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the best thing as well as just doing it automatically is that you can talk to everybody else around you while you're doing it. It's not a distraction catch right. up on a lot of things and yeah i think she's doing more zoom meetings for doing it and also there'll be one in bankers hill um i think with uh, thai food involved thai wow. and texting yeah so anybody who's interested you can message barbarabree.com um get caught up on that and and the software that that's being used is only for democrats it's a it's a group um that have set up there's only democratic candidates to use it but a lot of candidates are using it. So if you get if you learn how to do it with Barbara, you'll be able to do it with other campaigns in the future. Um, and it is a lot of fun. So that's great. Yeah, now, sorry, yeah, go ahead. I have one more thing and, and um, I should have brought it up before, but maybe it'll be faster with a smaller group. But when you donate to no, you know, to save our access, you know, the the organization that fights the 30 foot height limit expansion you your donation is processed by win red because they're they're associated with carl de mayo to process these donations uh, for no on the 30 foot height limit no on measure e then i am now on all sorts of republican lists including the National Federation of Republican Women. And they sent me an email saying, here's your password, you're all ready to go. And th I think this is a really disturbing part of trying to uh, donate through um, Save Our Access. I just wanted people to be aware of it because this is what's gonna happen to you. Um, and I don't know if there's another way to donate um, that doesn't include this, but I sure don't want to be on the list of win red. No, that's a very good point, Leslie. For, yeah, Reform San Diego, which is Carl de Mayo's group. Um, and Mandy mentioned, yeah, a, a number of people had removed themselves from that connection, if you like. And certainly all the things and the OB rag had also made it clear that although they support you know, no on on the on the height limit. In no way did they want to support anything that Carl De Mayo was behind, um, and so yeah, everything they'll be organising through the month of October for celebrations will be independent of that group for sure. And I, I see Arvin, Nicole, you have your hand raised. Uh, yes, I just want to say that somehow I got on Donald Trump's mailing list uh, that was before the 2020 election, and I still receive regular begging. Um, begging appeals from Trump. I have no idea how I got on because I have never uh, contributed to anybody uh, connected with him. But um, I get all, all kinds of letters, uh, emails addressed to Patriot. Yep. Well, as long as they keep spending money on you, that's a good thing, I guess, in one way. But yeah, sorry, Ruth, next. Well, along that line, way back when John McCain was running for president, my husband had me write a $500 check to his campaign. Uh, you know, military, and he was a Republican. I could get him to vote for any, level, any Democrat except presidential level. Anyway, throughout the years, I have gotten emails from various Republicans. This last election cycle, um, I only got it from two. Unfortunately, none of them were Trump, but it just shows you how long they will hold on to your name and address. And you know, John McCain is one thing, but Carl DeMaio, dear Lord. You yeah, know. well, the, it was the Bushes then that took it over from John McCain's mailing list. Uh, so. No, it's true. It'll get handed down for generations to come. You'll be you'll be getting <laughs> messages through. But you, just check it. They're not elected representatives and candidates. I think I know Doug had to leave early. He did put some notes in the in the in the chat that I'll just read very briefly. Uh, but if there's anybody else who wants to talk on behalf of a candidate or representative, you can raise your hand while I'm reading this. Uh, he mentioned. Uh, and this is his report for um, Pro Tem Tony Atkins. The California middle income tax credit rebates 
will start being direct deposited on October the 7th, and most taxpayers will receive theirs by early November. The refund will range between $200 and $1,050, depending on your filing status income and whether you have dependents. Senator Atkins anticipates the governor will be signing off on two of her key bills this week, SB 1375, which will allow qualified nurse practitioners to perform first trimester abortions, and SB 1013, which will add wine and distilled spirits containers to California's beverage container recycling redemption program. So I don't know any other comments from anybody? Nope, I don't see any. And so any other announcements? Actually, I'd like to make an announcement. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if anyone is planning to attend the PolitiFest that Voice of San Diego is organizing. It's going to be at University of San Diego on October 6th. And I've agreed along with Linda Lucas to be on the panel opposing the height limit increase. Um, they invited me to speak. The, the proponent will be uh, DK An Aniyawo. I can't, I, mm -hmm. I probably butchered that last name, but the, the Midway Planning Area uh, Chair and Chris Kate. And Chris is the council member who brought that forward for the ballot. So if anyone is interested um, in registering and attending, it would be nice to have some friendly faces in the audience. Um, and I think it's at 1030 on Saturday at University of San Diego. You can go to Voice of San Diego's website and look at all the panelists. Um, there'll be discussions on homelessness and a lot of other topics. Um, so I just wanted to remind people if you're interested in participating, asking questions, making comments, I hope that will be an opportunity to do so um, at, at this event. No, that's great, Laurie. And is that online as well, or is it just in person? Or No, that's a good question. They I think it's just in person. I, it could be because they charge for attendance. So if they do stream it, it might be after the fact, if they record it, it might be after the actual event. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll try and dig that up and Kip and we'll put it in the newsletter that we go oh, out. I can send, send you the details, meeting. John, if you want to yeah. send it out to members. Um, yeah, that'd be perfect, that'd be great. Or maybe I can just grab it. Let me see if I can get it online. Yep, excellent. And while Laurie's looking for that, any other announcements folks have? Or I'll just make a little announcement, and that is, yeah, thanks to everybody who came to the Pancakes on the Pier. You know, the club sponsored that um, this year, and uh, it was always a fun event. And then the OB Rag did post the most amusing uh, video with a nice kind of catchy, jammy-type song on there. And you'll, cap, you'll see caught on the video some of the club members as well towards the end. Well, you can skip towards the end if you don't want to watch the whole thing. But anyway, it's quite amusing. It's very nicely made. Okay, so with that, we'll 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 adjourn the meeting. I won't hang up and end the meeting here if we want to stay on and talk about anything. Um, but we'll officially adjourn the meeting and thank everybody again for coming. And uh, and our next meeting yet yeah, in October will be on all the measures and propositions. And we hope to have um, people to talk through those, answer questions for people. So if when you get your ballots, the beginning of October. You're not quite sure on any of the issues. You can either message us ahead of time or come to that meeting um, and we'll answer those questions. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Okay, bye-bye everybody. Bye. Bye.